We're going to read Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 39. Okay, we're going to read for most of this chapter. Uh, The rest of the chapter is also amazing, but it's kind of a different topic. So, you guys ready? All right. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a noise came from heaven like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They could see tongues of fire resting on each of them. Everyone was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now at that time, there were godly men in Jerusalem from every nation on earth. I'm going to just show you this in a slide. When this sound happened, a multi-ethnic crowd gathered bewildered because they could hear their own language being spoken. They were stunned because those speaking all these languages were from one area in Galilee. They asked themselves, how can these Galileans speak of God's mighty deeds in the native languages of Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, Cappadocians, as well as those from Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Rome, Crete, and Arabia? In their amazement, they asked each other about the significance of this moment. But there were some who made fun of the event by saying, they're just drunk with too much wine. Peter stood with the other apostles and began to preach. Men of Judea and those gathered in Jerusalem for the festival, listen as I explain. These men are not drunk as it may appear. After all, it's only nine in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel spoke about when he prophesied on God's behalf. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on humanity. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. And I will pour out my spirit on all who serve me, both male and female, and they will all prophesy. I will release signs and wonders in the sky with the sun becoming dark and the moon blood red before the awesome day that the Lord will return. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, hear this. Jesus from Nazareth, validated by signs, wonders, and miracles demonstrated among you, was delivered to you in God's providential plan to be nailed to a cross by ungodly men. He was killed, but God raised him up, and in doing so, ended the agony of death, because it was impossible for Jesus to remain in the grip of death. David said of Jesus, I saw the Lord, he is at my right hand, so I will not be shaken. My heart sings, my tongue worships, and my body lives with hope, because you will never allow me to go to hell or to simply die and decay. You've revealed the ways of life through me, and you fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, we're certain that our father David is dead and buried, and his bones are still with us in his tomb here on earth. Because he was prophetic and knew God's promise regarding his kingly descendants, he looked into the future to speak about the resurrection of the Christ, who was not abandoned in death and whose body never decayed. The father raised Jesus and were all witnesses of his resurrection. After being seated at God's right hand, he has poured out from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. And this is what you're experiencing. It wasn't David who ascended to heaven. David is speaking of Jesus when he says, the Father said to my Lord, sit at my right hand as I make your enemies a footstool at your feet. So all of Israel can know with certainty that God has validated Jesus as both Lord and Christ, the same Jesus that you crucified. When they heard this, they were deeply convicted at a heart level. And they asked Peter and the apostles, brothers, what do we do? Peter replied, repent. Each of you can then be baptized in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will then receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, and every descendant, including all that God calls to himself. Amen, huh? That's a good word right there. 
So I wanna just draw out a few lessons that would be good. I haven't spoken, as I said, on the person of the Holy Spirit in a while, so I'm gonna start with this simple truth. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's God. All right? As we relate to God, we need to understand God. There are no junior members of the Trinity. A lot of people think and imply and even teach that that's true, but that's heresy. In fact, the early church fathers made creeds to make sure that the early church understood the importance of the Trinity. The Trinity was a dividing line between Orthodox Christianity and cults and sects and heretics. Almost all the perversions that happened to Christians were because they changed their theology about the Trinity. So I wanna just talk for a minute about the Trinity because it's very important. The Trinity is the, the manifest threefold personality and role of one God. It's a little confusing for people to understand. There are no illustrations that work, that, that, that are adequate to explain this aspect or this nature of God, but there are, there's one that's sort of simple, and that is, my name is Mark. I have one name, it's Mark, but I actually have several roles, right? So my first role when I was born was I was a son. And because I had an older brother, I also, at the same time I became a son, I became a brother. So I had two immediate roles, right? Is that not true? As I grew up and got married, I became a husband. Now I had three roles. I didn't stop being a son. I didn't stop being a brother. Now as a husband, when I had children, I became a father. Does that make sense? It doesn't adequately compare to the nature of God because what I'm telling you is a chronology of events, but God is eternal. There's no chronology in that sense because the Son has always existed as God, the Son. He did manifest in a body at a certain point in time, but he was never not the Son. The Holy Spirit was never like a vapor that God the Father sort of whipped up. So it's, a lot of people think the Father is sort of the puppet master and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are his servants. That is not true. They have different roles. We know the Father, everything comes from the Father, and everything's going back to the Father, but in that being true, the, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not less than the Father. It would, God wouldn't be God if some aspect of his nature was less than God. Do you understand? So it's very important that we understand that the Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Father is God and as Jesus is God. There is no difference in the quality of godness among the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Many Christians relate to the Holy Spirit as though he's an it. They don't even know the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is worth knowing. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians 1.9 that our calling, our literal calling is to have friendship with the Holy Spirit. Not just with the Father, not just with the Son, but the Holy Spirit. We're actually called to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Benny Hinn's book called Good Morning Holy Spirit is a great book to read if you do not have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It will introduce you to the concept of a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And here's the thing about God that we have to understand. God is not a zero-sum God. It's not that God is 33 and a third percent Father, 33 and a third percent Son, and 33 and a third percent Spirit, and if we add a percentage to one, we have to take it from the other. God is 100 percent Father. He's 100 percent Son, and he's 100 percent Holy Spirit, or he's not God. And the Bible says, "Hear, O Israel, in De Deuteronomy 4, there is one God. He reveals himself and he actually exists in three persons as one God. I know that's hard to understand. Some people use the illustration of H2O, that it can exist in water, ice, and steam, but it's the same chemical composition. That's true, but what an inadequate illustration to explain the nature of the Trinity. Believers today are confused because they're taught by specialists, and I love specialists, except they tend to have a weakness. The thing about specialists 
as they don't tend to walk in fullness. And every believer is called to walk in fullness. We don't get a dab of the Father, a ton of the Son, and a little bit of the Holy Spirit, or a dab of the Holy Spirit, a ton of the Father, and a little bit of Jesus. Or a, you know, it doesn't work like that. We're called to know the Father and all that, is, all that he is. He, the Father, our whole lives are rooted and grounded in the love of the Father. Our identity, our security comes from knowing Father God. He's the source of everything. But the Bible says you're not conformed to the image of, you're conformed to the image of Christ. Paul said, everything in my life is dung, i.e. poop, compared to the excellency of knowing Christ. Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul said, I resolve to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. He said, listen, I don't preach about just sort of the philosophy of men. I preach Christ. So that, but, but when Paul says that, he's not taken away from the Father or taken away from the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? When Ananias and Sapphira were among those that were selling their lands and houses and they came to the apostles and they misrepresented their, their offering. They said, we're giving you the entire proceeds from the sale. They had the right to give whatever proceeds they wanted to, but they kept back the portion. They sold their house, let's say, for oh, 400,000, 500,000. What would work on the Central Coast? I don't know, 600,000? Well, 500,000. We'll pick 500,000. And they, and they kept about 200,000 for themselves. We're, gonna, we're reading between the lines here. It doesn't say. And they donated 300,000 to the church. And, they, and that was absolutely their prerogative. But what they said was, we donated all the proceeds of the house. Now, I don't know why God chose to pick on Ananias and Sapphira because many Christians lie. And they get away with it. But for some reason, in the holiness of this environment, the Lord dealt with Ananias and Sapphira very severely. And sometimes parents will do that. They'll do something in, in their family to show all the kids the rules, right? And I don't know how it works, but we have to believe it's the love of God, not his, he's not being mean, he's not being cruel, he's actually a very loving God, but he dealt with them very severely. I imagine it was because of the level of holiness that was going on in the early church. There was so much holiness, so much truth, so much reality that the Lord didn't want the impurity of dishonest believers entering into the midst of that early church family. And so, he, and so Peter said, Ananias, you have not lied to men but to the Holy Spirit. And then later he says, you've not lied to men but to God. God is the Holy Spirit. I hope you understand in your theology that God, the Holy Spirit, is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit isn't a junior God. He's God. And the Father and the Son are not jealous if you love the Holy Spirit. And the Son is not jealous if you love the Father and the Holy Spirit. And the, and the Holy Spirit's not jealous if you love the Father and the Son. In other words, church, we're called to love, experience, walk in the reality of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. If you're a member of Everyday Church, you just need to know right now, we are a people of fullness. We're not a people of the Word and not the Spirit. We're not a people of the Spirit and not the Word. We're a people of Word and Spirit. Not 50-50, 100-100, 110 110 We are absolutely biblical people. We love the Bible. But what keeps us from becoming knowledge-based, weird, legalistic, pharisaical Christians is the glorious Holy Spirit. Because when you take the Holy Spirit and you mingle it with the Word of God, you stay healthy. We're not just people that love the Holy Spirit, love manifestations, love experiences, and we have no grid to process them. We take every experience under the authority of the written scriptures. We have something to measure our experiences by. And if we don't see the fruit of the Spirit, we don't see biblical realities, we don't embrace it, period. So see, we need to be people of word and spirit, fully. And we need to be people of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen? Does that make sense? Um, as I said to you, the early church fathers used creeds I don't know if you're aware of this. There's the Apostles' Creed. There's the Nicene Creed. There's the Chalcedonian Creed. These early creeds were written by early church fathers that the church would memorize and say over and over, and they were especially focused on the Trinity and the virgin birth of Jesus. They were, they were very, very adamant and focused on making sure people understood the Trinity and understood the divinity of Jesus, basically. That's really what these early church fathers were seeking. And these, In fact, I just went on Billy Graham's 
uh, website. It's, it's, I know he's passed away, but it's Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And Billy Graham, has, has, he put a whole page on the Apostles' Creed on his website. It's so old. I mean, it's, it was written in about 150 AD, but he put it on his website so that ch- Christians today would know the creeds of the early church. They would understand. I mean, it's, it's not that profound. I mean, a lot of us have heard all the words in the creed, but it's profound in its simplicity because they felt it was necessary for the church to know theology about the Trinity. Now, some people badmouth theology or doctrine. Can I just tell you that the Bible says we're supposed to know doctrine? We're, doctrine is the organized theology of Scripture. That's all it is. It's, it's, and theology, the word theology simply means the study of God. The Bible says, study yourself to be approved unto God as workmen who do not need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. There's a right way to divide the word of truth, and there's a wrong way to divide the word of truth. That's what the scripture's saying. You need to know what the heck you're talking about. And so many people don't study the word of God to get their conclusions about the God that they worship. And sometimes we're worshiping the wrong God. That doesn't mean you're fake. I'm not not accusing you. I'm just saying... This is important, guys. What we're talking about is very, very important, and the Holy Spirit is God. So let me ask you a question. Don't answer out loud. It's a rhetorical question. Who's your favorite member of the Trinity? It's a trick question. In one sense, it's okay to have a favorite, in one sense. But sometimes that indicates brokenness. In fact, the whole ministry of Sozo is really about helping people relate to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's interesting when Christians relate to one or two members of the Trinity and not the second or third. Sometimes that indicates brokenness. When I, w- when I was saved, I fell in love with Jesus, but I was scared of the Father. I mean, I, I, I used the word Father. It's not like I didn't say, Our Father who art in heaven. I prayed to the Father, but he scared me because I grew up in a scary home where my dad was broken. He wasn't saved, and I was afraid of him. And so, unfortunately, what we do as humans is we, you know, we get imprinted like baby ducks in our home. Whatever mirror our parents hold up, good or bad, it becomes the mirror with which we see reality. So if the mirror that our parents hold up is one of those circus mirrors, that's what we see. We look back at ourselves and we see ourselves through the mirror that our parents hold up. God designed it this way so that functional, healthy parents could form Christ in their children. But when parents are broken, which most parents are, including me, we don't hold up a perfectly right mirror. And so the kids see a version of reality that isn't quite there. So the version that I saw was that dad is scary, mom's safe, right? And so I was in love with Jesus and I loved the Holy Spirit, but I didn't know what to do with the father. Now, I wouldn't have, I couldn't have articulated that back then when I was 16. That was, that was 40 some years ago. But that's what was, now that I'm older, I can see what was going on. And it took time for the Lord to teach me how to relate to my heavenly daddy. The Bible says that when we're sons, we can know God as daddy. That's not an irreverent term. That's a biblical term. The, the, the Greek word is Abba or Aramaic. It's Abba. Abba means daddy. And I just couldn't bring myself to call God that because I didn't relate to him in that way. Because I didn't think he related to me that way. And I came to find out that he absolutely adored me. And I thought... There's no way. I'm too aware of my weaknesses, my flaws. Some of you have the same problem today. You don't know that your heavenly daddy adores you. And you think, well, if he adores me, doesn't that mean he's endorsing my sin? No, not at all. God's able to separate your value from your performance. And he speaks to your value so that your performance changes. He doesn't speak to your performance so that your value changes, right? Because if he did it that way, your value would be based on your performance and you'd be a performance-based Christian. But he speaks to your value and your identity so that you will finally realize who you actually are. I love Ephesians 5.8. It says, you are light in the Lord. Now walk as children of the light. In other words, the Lord always tells you who you are and then he calls your behavior up to your identity. Amen? That's the Father. That's the Father. 
Every family in heaven on earth derives its name from our heavenly daddy. Everything is about family and about the father. But having said that, everything is about Christ. Everything is about Jesus, it is. You just read Colossians 2. The pinnacle is Jesus. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, meaning the Father is glorified when we honor Jesus. The Father isn't going, okay, you've honored Jesus, now get your attention back on me. That's not the Father. That would be a weird controlling daddy, wouldn't it? He's not insecure that his son receives glory. He likes it when his son receives glory. It makes him happy when the son receives your attention. And it makes the father and the son happy when you pay attention to the Holy Spirit. I want to just share a few truths about that in just a minute. We're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit relates to us, all right? So we love the father. We love the son, our Lord, our Savior, our King, our Bridegroom, and our friend. He is the Alpha and the Omega after all, isn't he? He's the beginning and the end. Paul said nothing else matters but knowing Christ. In fact, if you want to know what your life is about on earth, it's about becoming conformed to the image of Christ. If you've ever wondered what your destiny is, read Romans 8, 29. The Bible says that your destiny, which was determined beforehand, you've been predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. And by the way, the good news is when you're conformed to the image of Christ, Jesus is the spitting image of dad. And that's why Jesus said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There's, there's like so much unity among the Trinity, so much mutual honor, so much mutual submission, so much beauty that you can't offend the Trinity by loving the Trinity. Hello. So when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, remember that the entire Trinity is involved in this reality. The Father gives the gift of the Holy Spirit to his Son, and but once he gives the gift of the Holy Spirit to his Son, only the Son then can administrate the giving of the Holy Spirit, the baptizing. Jesus is the baptizer, not the Father. The Father gives the Holy Spirit to the Son. I know this sounds crazy, but this, the, I believe the reason these things happen is because of the mutual love and honor between Father and Son. They're, in, they're so intricately intertwined that they're all just like working together all the time. Does that make sense? So the Father gives the Holy Spirit to the Son. The Son then releases the Holy Spirit on the earth. Then he baptizes his, the Father's kids into the Holy Spirit. And we get dunked, immersed, filled up, and overflowing with the Holy Ghost. And the Father and the Son are going, yes. The Bible says that if you don't receive the Holy Spirit from Jesus, you're an orphan. Jesus is the one, not just dad. A lot of people teach that only the father can make you not an orphan. Actually, the Bible says that Jesus releases the Holy Spirit who takes away your orphan heart. The whole Trinity is involved in making us sons and daughters, not just the father. Everybody's involved, it's a full-time job, believe me. There's so much brokenness that we need the entire Trinity helping us to become sons and daughters. And the father's not insecure about that, he's very happy to have the entire Trinity working together to release sonship on the earth and daughtership. Amen? You guys all right? So let's talk about how the Holy Spirit relates to humanity because the Holy Spirit relates to humanity differently depending on where you're at. There are four ways, in my opinion, I could be wrong, you might be a theologian that knows more than me, praise God, you can write me an email, tell me I'm wrong, that's cool. This is my limited understanding. The Holy Spirit relates to humanity differently, and there are four basic ways that the Holy Spirit relates to humanity. I'm gonna just share them with you, okay? The first three are super simple. They're, the Holy Spirit can be with us, the Holy Spirit can be in us, the Holy Spirit can be upon us. The fourth way is the Holy Spirit can withdraw from us. I know that one sounds terrifying, so I'm gonna start with that one and unpack that. All right, you guys okay? All right, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did withdraw for a season from his people at times. The Bible calls that Ichabod. It says the glory departed from Israel. It's like the Holy Spirit just flew away. There was no glory. Uh, it's, it talks about the 400 years before Jesus came as the intertestamental period known as the silent years. There was really no prophetic word. There was no sort of anointing from the Holy Spirit for people to prophesy, so it's called the silent years in church history. 
because the Holy Spirit had withdrawn to a measure for certain reasons, okay? There were times where the Bible says the word of the Lord was rare in those days. So there were seasons where the Holy Spirit had pulled back a bit. Usually it was for disciplining Israel, okay? It was, it was corrective. It was to, and by the way, whenever the Lord withdraws, it is to create hunger for himself. The Lord loves to create hunger for himself because we are prone to eat junk food. And when we eat junk food, we don't, we're not hungry anymore for God. How many of you know that there's a lot of things offered in culture that can, we put into our spirits, but they don't satisfy? There, there is that classic reality that we have a God-shaped void or a God-shaped hole that only the Lord can fill. And when we put in the comforts of the world or human opinion or philosophy, whatever it is that we put in there, we're, 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 re, we're removing our hunger for God, but we're not being fed. So it's like putting styrofoam into that hole. So what the Lord does, he, would, he pulls back so that we get hungry, start pulling the styrofoam out, saying, I want the real thing. I don't, I'm not satisfied with the styrofoam anymore. Does that make sense? So the Holy Spirit would withdraw from his people for various reasons and for various seasons. David prayed in Psalm 51, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Do you know why he prayed that? Because Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 were his repentance prayers after he had sinned with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, and then had her husband killed. It was a horrific time, and then the baby died. So it was just a very difficult time for David. And he just, he's just saying, God... And Psalm 32 says that, that, you know, while I kept secret about my sin, because he was secret about his sin for about a year, while I kept secret with, about my sin, day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength drained away like the fever heat of summer. It was awful. I finally got honest. I confessed my sin, and you graciously forgave me. Thank you, God. But in that process, while he's yearning for the Lord, he just says, Lord, please don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Now, the reason he said that is at that time, in the old, under the old covenant, there was no resident Holy Spirit in people in permanent ways in the same way that it is today. So what we enjoy was not available to Old Testament believers. What we enjoy and take for granted sometimes is so powerful. It's sort of what, uh, I guess, was it Blake saying? Yeah, we have, this, we have the power of the resurrected Christ inside of us. Like we have inside, if you're a believer today, if you know Jesus, you have the resident Holy Spirit inside of you. You have God inside of you, which is unbelievably amazing. So the Holy Spirit can, has withdrawn for seasons from people, but he can also permanently withdraw from an unbeliever for two reasons. There's two reasons mentioned in Scripture. They, they might be the same reason, actually, but there's two things mentioned in Scripture as to why the Holy Spirit will withdraw permanently from a person. The first one is called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, okay? There's something that Jesus talked about. He said, if you blaspheme me, that's one thing, but if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven. Now, I, I just don't want to mess with that or change it. It's scary, I don't know all that it means, but I just know I don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And I will tell you this, if you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, you probably couldn't be here today because there would be no Holy Spirit to draw you here. So don't freak out. But what we don't want to do is blaspheme, dishonor, and, and I don't know that it, this is the definition of it, but Jesus sort of hinted that when we attribute the work of the Spirit to the devil, that might be part of it. I don't know, but that's something we want to be careful of. That's why it's don't be judgmental about the work of the Spirit. It says that, it says that when people prophesy, don't despise the prophetic. And I'll tell you why people despise the prophetic, because there's a mess in the prophetic. There's people that really hear God. There's people that sort of hear God, and they have hamburger helper, their own soul. And then there's people that say it's God, and it's actually the enemy. And because of that, we can start to despise the prophetic and go, oh, it's so messy. I don't want anything. To don't do that. The Bible says don't do that because we quench the Holy Spirit when we do that. We quench the activity of the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, desire, you know, love prophecy, obviously use discernment, but don't quench the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? The other thing scripture talks about is something called, I call it apostasy. It's called apostasy in the New Testament. There is the possibility among humanity, because the Bible says that, how many of you know that God wants everyone to be saved? 
And the Bible says the Lord is not willing that any should perish. That God's heart is that all of humanity would be saved. God is so loves people that his bent, his desire, his heart, his ambition is to have everyone saved. But the Bible says it's possible to say no to God so much and so often that the Bible says that we can be broken beyond remedy. There comes a place where the Lord can finally say, okay. That's called apostasy. It's, it's a brokenness where we just reject the Lord so much and so often that he finally just agrees with us. It's not God sending people to hell. It's people sending themselves to hell. Because hell, it's not just fire. It's the absence of God. God is light and love. That means everything that's beautiful, everything that's majestic, everything that's holy, everything that's lovely, everything that's warm and brings affection is God. Like God is light and God is love. So for God to withdraw his light and love, there's only darkness and hate left. So when people say no, 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 and God finally says, okay, that's it. That's called being broken beyond. I think it takes a lot, a lot for that to happen, but I, I think the scripture is clear that it does happen. So it's possible for the Holy Spirit to withdraw permanently on rare occasions. I don't think it happens that much, but on the other hand, I'm not God, so I don't know. I just know God's such a good God. He's so merciful, he's so kind. I think we'll all be surprised who's in heaven. And to be honest with you, I don't even like sharing this because I don't want anybody to miss out. My heart is like, I, I'm like the Lord. I want everybody in. If I didn't think universalism was heresy, I'd be a universalist, but I'm not. <laughs> but I want everybody in. I want everybody to come into the kingdom. In fact, Christians that don't want everybody to come in scare me. Because I'm like, why? Why? Because they want people to suffer. And some people need to feel right. And the way they feel right is to know that others are wrong. And that scares me. Because Jesus is good enough with or without hell, honestly. I, I believe there is a hell. I'm just saying. He's good enough without needing other people to get punished. Is that not true? Just have a heart like the Lord that none should perish. We don't want anybody to perish, amen? Now, if that's true, we need to be a little more like Abby and the team in Mexico. We don't want to sit on our laurels and say, God doesn't want anyone to perish, but I'm not lifting a finger personally. Let's go get them. Let's go get them. Let's go find them. Let's bring them into the family. Evangelism isn't a task to do. It's the love of God for people. It's saying God wants you in the family. Amen? And the Bible says that Jesus grabbed his disciples, and the first thing he told them, he says, if you'll follow me, I'll teach you to become fishers of men. I'll teach you how to get people. And if we're followers of Jesus, the Lord wants to teach us how to get people because he cares about people, and his hands and his feet and his eyes and his ears are you and me. He's doing it mostly through, now he is appearing to people, but he mostly does it through humanity. He loves to reach people through people. There's something about the humility of God that he would rather step back and use you. And you know what's amazing about God? All of us are Clark Kent. We're fumbling around with our glasses, tripping over our desk and, you know, staring at Lois Lane. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. We're just, we got our issues. But when the anointing comes on us, we're supermen. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's why the Bible says this power is in jars of clay. This glorious resurrection power is in Clark Kent's. We are, that's who we are. Apart from God, we can do nothing. But when the Holy Spirit comes on us, it's a different deal. The anointing breaks the yoke. The dead can be raised through you and me as the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Isn't that awesome? Now, can the Holy Spirit withdraw, quote-unquote, temporarily from a New Testament believer? Yes, not fully withdraw, but he can pull back, right? The Bible, we already know he can be quenched. We know in Ephesians 4 he can be grieved, right? That doesn't mean that he leaves us or forsakes us, but can the Lord not? The Bible says in James 4 that he resists the proud. So you ever, you ever known the intimate fellowship of God, then you get offended, and all of a sudden you can't experience God, and you're like, where'd you go, Lord? And he's like... I'm resisting you right now. I love you, but I'm withdrawing a little bit so you can find out what you're like without me because that's how you're acting. You're acting like I don't matter, so let me remind you that I matter. So there is the sort of loving, fatherly 
withdrawal that comes with any good dad bringing discipline to his kids. Amen? Does that make sense? That's sort of a different thing. We don't want the Holy Spirit to withdraw on any level. But the good news is, I've got a lot of good news, so I just want to give you that sort of little caveat about that. But to stay in right relationship with the Holy Spirit, we need to reverence the Holy Spirit as fully God. We have a direct relationship with the Holy Spirit. It is not wrong to say, good morning, Holy Spirit. Any more than it's wrong to say, I love you, Jesus. Any more than it's wrong to say, our Father who art in heaven. Right? We love God. One God manifest in three persons. I love what Heidi Baker says. Heidi Baker, one of the reasons I love Heidi Baker as the leader of Iris Global is that she's one of the people on earth that I think walks in fullness the most. She is so incredibly rooted in the love of the Father. I mean, she just oozes the love of the Father. She has more love. She embraces more people. She overlooks more sin. She's so gracious. She just, just, just the love of the Father just pours out of her. But she's also desperately in love with Jesus, just desperately in love with Jesus. And she honors Jesus. Every time I hear her talk, she loves the Lord Jesus Christ. She honors him. She preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. She's awesome. And she loves the Holy Spirit. She says, Holy Spirit, possess me. Wear me like a glove. And the, the reality is, is that she is manifesting the fruit of a life that loves God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's a reason there's 10,000 churches. There's a reason that there's schools all over. There's a reason that they have the top school in Mozambique and they're building the top university. There's a reason these things are happening. There's a reason that 10,000 children are getting fed every day, 20,000. It's because of a person who's fully in touch with and knows and loves God in all of who he is. And I love that about her. So let's talk about the in, with, and upon for just a minute, and then we've got to stop, and we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit next week, okay? But let me just sort of begin down this road of the with, in, and upon. You guys ready? The Holy Spirit is with people, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean he's taken up residence inside of people, which is the in, okay? But it can be both. We can have the with, the in, and the upon in one person. But some people, he's just with them, okay? In fact, a lot of times in the Old Testament, you'll see these words, the whole, um, do not fear for God is with you. And it's speaking of the, whole, the reality of the Holy Spirit with the person. It's talking about the Father's favor and the presence of the Holy Spirit at the same time. In fact, the Holy Spirit was with people and he came upon people. Do you, did you know that? And he was even in people to a degree, not in the same way as the New Testament, but it says that Bezalel, who was one of the uh, craftsmen that created, right, he created so much of the temple, the, the tabernacle work, it says the Lord filled him with the Holy Spirit of wisdom and understanding and knowledge. So it's not the same thing as the New Testament filling, but the Holy Spirit filled him with what he needed to actually build the tabernacle. Does that make sense? And, and you got guys like Samson, who was very imperfect, but he had taken a Nazarite vow to not cut his hair, and as he honored the Lord, the Holy Spirit would come upon him in power, and he would rock the place, but he had moral issues, he had worship issues, he had all kinds of issues, and so that's why you can never look at the anointing to decide if somebody has good character, because the Holy Spirit comes upon people for a purpose, which may or may not reflect on the worthiness or the godliness of the vessel. Does that make sense? That's why we can never get enamored with anointing. We, we can love the anointing, but we never get enamored with it because we can be deceived, right? We love the anointing. We love the power of the Holy Spirit, but we don't worship people who have the anointing. We, there's, we measure fruit differently. We measure fruit by the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the Spirit. So we do look at works. We do look at the impact of the Holy Spirit. We also look at love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? Amen? You guys okay? Anybody confused yet? Hopefully not. So why does the Holy Spirit, why is he with people? For support, for comfort, for help, but also to convict us and to draw us to God. 
a lot of times what you'll see, I don't know how it was for you, but when I was, because I wasn't raised in a Christian home, I had no knowledge of the Holy Spirit. I didn't even know what the word Holy Spirit meant. I had no knowledge at all. But as I look back on my life, there was a period where it just, it, the Holy Spirit began to sort of be with me, began to work with me and pull me and draw me and convict me and, right? How many of you know the Bible says that no one can come to God unless the Father draws him, right? How does the Father draw him? He releases the activity of his spirit, right? Because the Bible says God is spirit. Oh, this can get a little confusing, but God draws us with his spirit, the activity of his spirit. It's the Father drawing by the activity of the Holy Spirit. That's how in cooperation they are. And we come to God because the activity of the Spirit is drawing us to God, convicting us. That's why the Lord is called the hound of heaven in some places because he just, when he, when he gets a hold of someone, he just doesn't let go. He just keeps going. Although the Bible does say in Genesis 6, my spirit will not always strive with people. So there is a time where we, he withdraws, as I mentioned before, we never want to go there. I personally don't want to go up to the line and tempt God and see how much I can get away with. How about you? See, the things in Scripture that bring us concern are to help us stay in the main and plain of God, to stay in the safe zone, to stay in the center of the playground, to not live at the fence and be flirting with sin. Amen? It's good when the fear of the Lord comes upon us because it gets us back where we need to be, in the middle, in the center with God. Amen? Then there's the in. The in is awesome. In the New Testament, Jesus changed everything. In John 14, verses 16 and 17, let me just read this to you. Listen, we're going to end with this. Listen, I will ask the Father, Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, meaning besides me, because I'm your helper now, because I'm on earth, but I'm just in a body, I'm limited. He's going to give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. So here's what's amazing. Number one, believers get the width of the Holy Spirit forever. You get the width of the Holy Spirit forever. Does that make sense? This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. The world is unable to receive the spirit of truth because the devil is the father of lies. And the Bible says the whole world is under the spell of the evil one. They can't, the spirit of truth is too powerful. The Holy Spirit is too strong for people under deception to fully receive unless the Father helps them, unless there's help from God. That's what this, it doesn't mean they can never receive. It means they need God to help them. Whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. How many of you know you need to have God open your eyes and open your understanding? I remember when I was being evangelized and I didn't know it, I could not understand, I've shared this, I could not understand a single word that was being said. It was very much like this for me. Blah, 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 blah. I remember going to a camp, and it was a Baptist camp, and I was 7, 16, 17, and I was the only clearly evident non-Christian there. And so we were all sitting around the campfire. There was about 25 of us, and I'm just in my mode. I'm just thinking about how to smoke marijuana next and what I'm going to do, and I'm thinking about the girls that are in the... I'm just, that's where my head's at. I have no clue what, why I'm even there except to meet new friends. I have, I'm not there for God at all, at all. And everybody's sitting around the campfire, and the youth leader is over there, and I'm standing. I'm a little bit out of the circle, and, and the youth leader starts talking, and all of a sudden, and, I, and it, all I'm hearing is blah, blah. I cannot understand a single word he's... I'm serious. I could not... You couldn't have paid me to recite back what he said. I'd be like, I have no idea what he said. But at a certain point, the entire 25 just stared at me. That's all I knew. I just knew they all looked at me, and he was talking about me. And I felt very uncomfortable, but I didn't know why. I was like, he's talking about me. And then I was like, one of these things is not like the other one. One of these things does not belong. It was me. I didn't belong. I wasn't a Baptist. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't a church guy. I wasn't anybody. I was just like hanging out, waiting to do drugs. And they're all like, uh, we're talking to you right now. And it was, it was an invitation to receive Christ, I found out. But I had no clue. I didn't even know. I was like, what, what, what? That made me want to smoke marijuana even more. I was like, wow, that was a trip. 
But what's amazing, I came back from that camp, we moved to San Luis Obispo, and I started going to San Luis Obispo High School, and this really weird guy came up to me in the hallway. I just was like, get away from me, creepy guy. And he's got this little booklet, The Four Spiritual Laws, you know, and he's like, you know God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? And I'm like, go away. He's so, like, here's two circles that represent two different lives. One is in chaos and one is in harmony. Which life represents your life? I said, chaos. And he said, which circle do you want to represent your life? I said, chaos. And he's all, you're not supposed to say that. But I, I was just being honest. I'm like, I don't want that other thing. It looks like there's a cross on a chair. I don't want the chair or the cross. I want the chaos. And I was being honest because I had no understanding of what he was talking about. But then, because it was a new high school, it was my third high school that year, parents were getting a divorce. I didn't have friends. I was like, okay, I guess I'll go to this stupid Bible study with these weird, weird, weird people. And I started going to church. And the preacher would just, he seemed angry. I'm all, what is his problem? He's a fiery Baptist preacher. Oh, man. Veins, red, bulging eyes. And I'm like, yeah. But I noticed after about three or four weeks, I could hear. I could hear. My ears opened. And my eyes opened. I was like, I'm lost. I need to get saved. I need Jesus in my heart. <gasps> I'm not a Christian. I thought, I, was, I thought all Americans were Christian. I thought, I'm a Christian. I'm an American. I was like, <gasps> it's not true. I've misunderstood these, all these years. And I ran to get saved. Oh, and I got gloriously saved. Like, it changed overnight. I'm just saying that to say, I'm just saying that to illustrate this verse. Jesus said, the world cannot see or hear. You can't know God. It's not punishment. It's just you're not able to. You, don't, you need the Holy Spirit to it, open your eyes and open your, one of the best things you can do when you pray for your unsaved friends is to first of all, bind the work of the enemy. You have the authority to bind and loose on earth as in heaven. So just bind them up. Tie them up with your prayer because you have authority from Jesus. Because actually that person belongs to God, believe it or not. They're made in the image of God. Jesus paid for them. They are, God's already bought them. He's waiting for you and I to claim that on the earth as in heaven. He's looking for divine partnership. So go ahead and bind the activity of the enemy and release the activity of the Holy Spirit. Lord, open their eyes. Open their ears and let their heart understand who you are. Let them understand. Soften their hearts. We break the power of hardness of heart. And... And you know what? It works because God is waiting for you and I to partner with him in prayer because he's already committed to this process. For some reason, he wants us involved. It's not up to you. Just partner with a beautifully amazing, huge God that loves saving people. And he doesn't just save them so they avoid hell. He saves them because he loves relationship. He wants to bring them into his family. He loves humanity deeply, like he created us for relationship. How many of you know there's going to come a time, heaven, all that's going to, we're not even going to be thinking that way. We're going to be in heaven with him, and we're going to understand his actual nature because he, he redeemed us to have relationship with us. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 7 that the kindness of God will be shown to us in, in like successive ways for all of eternity until we finally realize how good he is. Like we're going to get saved, go to heaven, be, have a perfect body, all that stuff, but God says even though all that's true, I want to spend all of eternity convincing you of how much you're loved. Like, that is crazy. And it needs to start now, by the way. Eternal life is knowing God and his son, God, Jesus Christ. Woo, and the Holy Spirit, that's right. It doesn't say it in that verse, but it says it in other places. The promise of the Holy Spirit is that he will abide with you until he's in you. Like he's calling humanity to himself. And once we're saved, we get the Holy Spirit with us. What did, what did you say? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So 
The Bible's awesome because he's, the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Christ. Like, like, like the Holy Spirit releases the reality of the Father and the reality of the Son to us. He really doesn't even speak of himself. Jesus and the Father speak of the Holy Spirit. Like there's so much honor among the Trinity. They're outdoing each other with honor. But the Holy Spirit doesn't just promise to be with us, but in us and upon us, which we're going to talk about next week. The upon reality is so amazing that some believers are missing out, not because it doesn't matter what denomination you belong to, it's because we don't know the Holy Spirit. We don't know the fullness of what's available to us, so make sure you come next week because this is part two. We want to talk about how to experience all of what the Holy Spirit has for us. Now, let me just finish here. I'm going to, I'll deal with this in a, I'm going to finish this next week, but some of you may be in a place with the Holy Spirit where he, you feel like he's withdrawn. You need to come back to God and to invite the Holy Spirit to have his way with you. It's possible that the Holy Spirit brought you here today so that you could return to God. The withdrawing was to make you hungry enough to come to a church service where you could hear that the Holy Spirit is drawing you back to himself. Some of you may be convicted by the Holy Spirit because he's been with you and he's been drawing you and he's now bringing you into, he wants to bring you into relationship with Jesus. He wants to have Christ in you, the hope of glory. He wants to put the reality of God inside of you. So there's a river of living water living inside of you so that you live life now from the inside out instead of from the outside in. It's called being born again. It's an amazing reality. And it is a reality. It's not just a theology. It's not just a message. It's a reality. Some of you may have known God is with you, but you really don't know if he's in you. Now, I I just want to say this, that without any judgment, there are a lot of churches today that have really nice people in them that aren't born again. But they're good people, they're moral people, they try to do good stuff, you know, they kind of obey the golden rule. But that's not what makes a Christian. The only difference between a Christian and non-Christian is that the Holy Spirit is living inside of a Christian. God has taken up residence inside of a believer. See, when I was not a Christian, I was on the outside looking in. I could see for the first time the kingdom of God, and I knew that I was on the outside, and I wanted to get in. And when I got in, he got in me, and it all got messy then. It was like, wow, this is awesome. But some people are moral, they're nice, they're good people, they give philanthropically. That's not what makes a Christian. That's the result of him living inside of us, not the definition. There are other people that are trying to be good by obeying the law, and they're cranky, They're mean, they're judgmental, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will make you nice. The Holy Spirit will help you like people. And some of you may know God. You might be born again. The Holy Spirit might be inside of you, but you've lacked power and anointing. We're going to talk about that next week. You don't know the upon reality. It doesn't make you a deficient second-class Christian. It just means you need the upon reality. That's all. And we're going to talk about how to receive that. There's, it's so easy. You don't have to run three laps around the mountain. You don't have to do any spiritual push-ups. You just receive. Because the Holy Spirit is right here, right now. He's just ready. He, oh, he's ready. I just want you to know, every time you come to church, the Holy Spirit's locked and loaded. He's ready. I, I mean that in the best way. He is ready to give you what you need. He's ready to deposit in you what you need. Meaning, whenever God shows up, he shows up for a reason. You don't need to be vague. You don't need to be wondering. He always comes to bless people. He always comes to help those who don't know him, know him. Those who know him, know him better. Those that don't know anointing to experience fresh anointing on their lives.